All right, we're going to talk about anode, bevel, and focal spot. And so we'll go back over really the construction of the x-ray tube. So we know in the x-ray tube there is a cathode that produces electrons by thermionic emission, and then there is this anode that is positively charged. The electrons strike the anode, and they produce the x-rays. The anode has an angulation to it. And that, that geometry, that angle, we're basically using to create something like a bank shot. Um, and so the geometry of, are, are we familiar with the term bank shot? Like if you're lining up a pool shot and the, there's a ball in your way, you might need to bump it off of the wall to strike the ball that you're trying to hit. That's what, that's what I mean by a bank shot. And so that's kind of the same geometry, that it's exactly the same geometry that we're using here and why we're employing an, an angle on the anode. So here's the objectives that I've set out. So be prepared to see these same objectives again, right, on the objective sheet that I'll give you. Um, but they, we need to describe how this line fo focus principle is used to increase image sharpness and decrease the heat load. So it's going to do those two things, right? Um, we will want this is actually a super helpful principle to employ, this, this bank shot that I'm describing. Um, but it does have some drawbacks. It's not perfect, right? So there's ways that it can sharpen things on one side. Um, it can make an anode heel effect where there's more x-rays being produced in a certain direction than in, in another direction. So we need to be aware of the limitations of this. It's an improvement. It's a technological improvement. But it didn't fix everything. And then the last two things is we'll want to quantify um, how focal spot size relates to penumbra. So this is, a, again, something of a review. We've talked about penumbra once already, and it's that shadow that's kind of cast or the blurriness that exists on the image. Um, and then we'll finally talk about why this focal spot size is considered kind of the controlling factor for image sharpness. Right? Are there other things that influence image sharpness? Yes, but we're going to mostly just focus on focal spot size. And so um, I can't stress it enough because there's a common point of stumbling here, right? And it has to do with all the warm-up procedures you've ever done in the lab, right? Which focal spot size have I said do the, the warm-up procedures on? The large focal spot size, right? And the only reason for that has to do with, like we experienced earlier this trimester, you could potentially blow the tube out if you have too much heat on that small focal spot size, right? But there are tubes, particularly tubes that are used in interventional, like in cardio cath, that are using a really small focal spot size and they have a high tube heat load because they're running those fluoro machines for hours tracking the, the, where the catheter is going through the heart. So I want the, what I'm saying is just because we have this heat limit problem does not mean that focal spot size in any way influences technique. It does not affect technique. It does not affect things like mass. It does not affect things like KVP. It just affects tube life. Good job. It just affects the life of that tube, right? So primarily, though, and the reason I'm stressing that <laughs> the reason I'm stressing that is because I only this is a simplification point. You are going to have a question where they try to distract you with this, and all you need to know about focal spot size is it's only affecting image sharpness. Period. End of story. Forget about all the distractions. So I'm trying to break this down as much as possible because I know this is some geometry and it can seem a little scary. So let's define some terms before we get into the geometry part. All right? There's, there's really three terms that um, we need to be pretty familiar with when we talk about this. Um, so the first is just this line focus principle that we can use uh, the angle of the anode to focus things down. We can use the angle of the anode to focus things down. 
<laughs> okay. So that's the first thing that I'm defining is the line focusing principle that we can use the angle of the anode to create greater or less spatial resolution. I'm trying to break this down as much as possible. The line focus principle is that we can use the angle of the anode to create more or less spatial resolution and we've compared that to a cowboy boot being a low anode angle and a high heel being something like a high um, anode angle and it would create a smaller area so higher spatial resolution. Alright so but we need to kind of further describe this so I'm going to draw just a little bit on this whiteboard thing here like a five-year-old. There's the actual fo focal spot this is the area available on the anode to disperse the heat generated by x-ray production. So if I'm drawing the an oh my lord, if I'm drawing the anode angle here, right, the actual focal spot is this actual area from here to here on the anode, right, where the, all the x-ray interactions are happening and the heat is being dispersed. That's the actual focal spot. Then there's the effective focal spot. This is the area that we have of x-rays exiting the anode. So you can see in this case, it's smaller. I should have drawn that a little bit more exaggerated, but it is smaller than the area that's being struck on the anode. Right? So here we have um, electrons, right? And over here we have x-rays um, exiting. This is really hard to write with my finger on. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the effective focal spot. It's controlled by both the width of that electron beam and the angle of the anode bevel. If you see anode bevel, don't, don't be scared by that. It's just saying, what is the angle of the anode? Right? Um, the smaller the effective focal spot, the greater the image sharpness. So the smaller that effective focal spot gets, the sharper our image will be. Um, and then finally, the effective focal spot size is made smaller than the actual focal spot size by decreasing the anode bevel angle. Right? So when you see that, I, I've, taught, I've compared it to the high heel shoe. Right? Um, that it has a decreased anode bevel angle. So um, you may be wondering, well, how is the anode bevel angle decreased, right? Well, if I were to draw these two angles up here, so, oh, I lost my little drawing function. So let's say that that is our cowboy boot, right? And this is our high heel. Which one of those angles is larger? The cowboy boot. This is a bigger angle measurement here than right here. That's all that that's referring to. Okay? Now, one thing that I might add, okay, just so we don't get, I don't want us to get lost in any of the terminology here, because terminology is really key to this. Um, and even if we are, even if we're still struggling to understand this focusing principle, that's fine. If we grasp these terms, we're we'll do, we're doing well, right? So the last thing I want to, I don't want you to see a different term and get thrown off. I'm going to draw you a picture of the anode now as if I were electron, I'm an electron flying towards it, right? If I was an electron flying towards the anode, it would look like a giant circle, right? Um, and what I'm flying towards is one particular place on the circle, right? But you'll notice there's this track, and so we sometimes refer to that as the focal track, right? What is the focal track? Well, it's, if you can imagine, it's the entire area on the anode that electrons might be attracted to. I think about it as being something like the groove in the record, right? that the needle's running on. The needle's only in that one place at one particular time on the record. That is 
the focal spot, but that entire track is playing the song. If you're walking with me on that. So don't get don't get thrown off by that additional term. The focal track just means that entire area around the anode that's designed to produce x-rays. So here we see it just drawn out in greater detail from our textbook. You can see the smaller angle, right? So the high heel shoe is the one on the left right now. And the, the fatter heeled shoe, like the cowboy boot shoe, is the one on the right, okay? Um, and the way I, I remember this, the mnemonic, I used to remember this, I think I've shared this with y'all before, um, is the sex appeal is in the heel, right? Have I shared that with y'all? came from this goof, goofy movie, this British movie called uh, Kinky Boots. But the idea being, it's a good movie actually, it's, it's, a, it's, a, com it's a comedy. Um, but the idea being that the sharper that heel is, the prettier the picture is that results, right? So I like that because it, it reminds me that, okay, that, that 17 degree angle, that, that high heel shoe makes for higher spatial resolution, right? But at the same time, like I've already said, if I'm gonna be walking five miles, do I wanna be wearing that high heel shoe? No, I don't. So if I'm doing an abdomen x-ray, what, what am I talking about? If I'm doing an abdomen x-ray, if I'm doing a lateral L-spine, that's walking five miles, right? Because so I need that additional, I need that additional support to make that picture. So I'm gonna choose the fatter heel, right? I'm gonna choose the larger focal spot size. If I'm doing a lateral lumbar spine, or a spot, or an abdomen, or anything that requires more mass, I'm gonna choose the larger effective focal spot size. It can disperse more heat. It's not gonna get me as pretty of a picture, but it can disperse more heat. So I've said it once, I'm gonna say it yet again. Did that decision have anything to do with the mass that I was setting? No. It had solely to do with the heat units that the machine's capable of, and like Ms. Henderson said, the tube life, right? The consideration at the end of the day is solely a consideration of spatial resolution versus heat, heat units. Okay. Now let's talk about what's actually projected, okay? Because unfortunately, the x-rays don't follow the nice, neat lines that I drew with the extension cord, right? They go off in funny directions, right? Um, so if I could look up at the actual focal spot now um, from the image receptor, right? What would I be seeing? Well, what I would see is the area, the area, like I've already said, it would appear smaller than the electron beam. Like it would, it would appear smaller, right? But it would, it would be giving me different levels of intensity, right? And so what we're talking about here is that there is a sharpness on the anode end of the image. It's sharper than on the cathode end of the image. So it's sharper on the anode end than on the cathode end. And you can see that right here, right? If I were walking, if you could imagine me being a tiny person, I'm looking up towards this uh, effective focal spot size. From this angle, at position number four, it seems pretty big, right? But as I get to right here, it seems super small. Like it almost looks like a point at this point. And so you can see the sharpness has improved right, the further um, underneath the anode I've gone, right? So w another way of saying the same thing is that there is higher spatial resolution on the anode side of the x-ray tube than on the cathode side of the x-ray tube. There's higher spatial resolution on the anode side of the x-ray tube than on the cathode side of the x-ray tube. And this just goes back to that projected focal spot. Considerations related to that. And this feeds right into the anode heel effect, right? So this is now a variation intensity. What was I, what I was talking about in the last slide was a variation in spatial resolution. 
but it maps directly onto this variation in intensity that on the anode side of the x-ray tube there is lower x-ray intensity than on the cathode side and the mnemonic that people generally use to remember this is fat cat that you want the thicker part of the patient on the cathode side of the x-ray tube and most room design is done to accommodate just that interesting factoid though we got a new x-ray tube in the smaller examination room and if you look at it closely it's installed improperly right they did it wrong they did it right but what they they were able to find a refurbished tube and it's interesting you have to know which side of the table the tube is on right they were able to find a refurbished tube and make it work for our room but it's it's for a different it's for an other table design like what we have in the other room right so when they installed it the cathode side if you're I'll show you all this here in just a second if you roll the tube up it's on the lower side which is not where you would want it um, for chest x-ray examination things like that it, it, it winds up upside down in other words it winds up upside down so we take advantage of the anode heel effect in room design that's the primary place that we take advantage of anode heel effect so just know the way that I generally try to remember this is again fat cat you want the cathode side on the larger side of the patient's body for the most part that translates that if I'm doing a chest x-ray the anode side should be pointing towards the ceiling the cathode side should be pointing towards the floor so that as I'm looking at the patient the anode side is hitting up here and the cathode side is hitting down here why because I need more x-rays to penetrate right here than up here just given the patient's anatomy so but the, what we need to know for the purposes of the registry and things like that is just what's on this slide um, that the anode acts as a form of inherent filtration and it creates a somewhat wedge-shaped x-ray beam creates a somewhat wedge-shaped x-ray beam and so we can use that to our benefit um, if we're using the anode um, effectively so as a general rule of thumb it is best to place the thinnest end of the anatomy towards the anode side of the x-ray tube so this is just a restatement of the fat cat principle And here is just a, a slide showing us, you know, kind of um, in x-ray form, this, uh, this kind of breakdown that we've already talked about, right? Um, nothing really to add to that. Okay, focal spot size. So we've been talking a lot about focal spot size um, and this, this illustration here is assuming just kind of a uniform small focal spot size. So we can, we can change on our x-ray tube, we can decide if we want to use the large focal spot size or the small focal spot size and largely that's controlled actually on the cathode side by which, which coil is activated. Is it a small coil or a large coil that's activated? Right. So, um, image quality is primarily determined by the effective focal spot, right? By by what's uh, exiting off of the X-ray tube after it's hit the uh, bank shot or whatever. So, focal spot size is the only technical factor that exclusively affects image sharpness. So if I'm doing an orthopedic study of someone's hand, I want the small focal spot size. Why? Because it has improved spatial resolution. I can see a little tiny fracture, right? Um, the smaller the focal spot size, the sharper the recorded detail. But like I've already kind of stressed, a larger focal spot 
these are capable of withstanding a higher tube heat limit. Right? So it's not that I wouldn't like high spatial resolution on a lateral L spine. I would love high spatial resolution on a lateral L spine. I just am up against the constraints of the technology, what the technology is capable of withstanding. So this focal spot size is directly proportional to penumbra. And you can see um, penumbra here uh, from our textbook in two comparisons. Nothing changes. If you notice on these drawings, the SID is not changing, the OID is not changing, the SOD is not changing. The only thing that is changing is the size of the focal spot. And when the focal spots change from a small size to a large size, what happens to this area here that's the perceived edge? It's getting bigger, right? When I went to the large focal spot size, this area here, the area of the penumbra, increased. And that is unsharpness, by definition. That area of that shadow results in blur on the image. The only area that's a true shadow is what we call the umbra, right? Um, interestingly enough, focal spot size does not affect image magnification, shape distortion, exposure, right? It is not affecting exposure. I've said that a lot. It does not affect contrast. It does not affect noise. It is just influencing sharpness. And what we can actually measure is unsharpness. It's affecting this size of the penumbra. So um, one way to think about this is the umbrella versus the rain cloud way of thinking about things. Right? The umbrella versus the rain cloud. We've had a lot of rain recently. Um, the umbrella, the area that your body is protected from the rain, right, is the area underneath the umbrella. That is the umbra of the image. Right? It's the umbra of the image. Um, so if you imagine the little rain droplets being the x-rays that are coming towards you, right? And the splash that's coming off of the umbrella. That splash we're going to call the, the, um, the penumbra, right? The area that's not actually covered, but it's, there's like that blurriness there where there's splash coming off of the umbrella. Um, so would, what would change if the rain cloud got bigger? If the rain cloud was really, really big, what would happen to the area of the splash? It would be much bigger, right? Um, in fact, some of it would even invade in on the area that's covered, that's covering me. I might start getting wet even though I'm standing underneath the umbrella, and that's happened to me a lot this week. Um, versus if I had this little tiny, cute uh, rain cloud here, right? A little tiny rain cloud that's actually smaller than the area of the umbrella, right? What's going on with the splash? Yeah, there may not be any splash coming off the side of the umbrella at all, right? So that would again would be that decreased area of penumbra. Just a different way of thinking about it, maybe a little bit more practical, I don't know. And the final thing I'll say, because I've helped a lot of girls down the stair at graduation, is as much as the sex appeal may be in the heel, those shoes are damn dangerous, right? <laughs> like. Orthopedic surgeons probably have some kind of money in this whole high heel shoe racket, right? It's bad. And this is actual dislocated midfoot um, fracture realigned with all sorts of screws and pins due to a high heel, right? So um, particularly, I think what they call, uh, what do they call the really high ones? Are they called skyline heels or something? Stilettos. 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 I don't know. I don't know what they're called. Um, but the really tall ones, right, where you're like up and it's like compressing your toes, those are particularly bad, right? You're going to have to help me down the stairs at graduation. That's what I'm wearing. I know. I, I'm, that is fine, but, but, but this is actual foot and ankle surgeon saying the midfoot arch is particularly susceptible to injury when wearing high heels. The foot is not designed to function in this position, so when one trips or falls in high heels, there can be excessive force placed on the midfoot, causing it to break or dislocate. So um, consider that a caution. And I guess what he's saying is don't trip or fall while wearing it. <laughs>
All right.